All right, so um, if I was to ask you the question, who is God, where would you start? How would you start to get to that, an answer to that question? How would you know? Got any thoughts? Do you know who God is? Yeah? So how would you answer it? You got any idea? Makes everything good. All right, so that. Boy, God made her baby voice too. She's really annoying. She's really annoying. Well, there you go. So, so we think about, um, what, if we think about God makes everything, right? That is learning about God based on what God does, right? Is that one thing we can think about? That what the things that God does, things that we can witness God doing. That's one way to get to know who God is, right? So we can think about all the different things that God does in the Bible, maybe the things that God does in our lives. We can look out at the world of creation that we see, and that can teach us about who God is. Is there any other things that we can do to find out who God is? Church. Church? Could be. How does the church teach about God? Any thoughts? <coughs> so if you were if you were going to say that you know a person, how would you get to know a person? One of those is about the, what they do, right? The things they do. And we already talked about that with God. What else might you get to know about a person based on them? You know? Got any thoughts? It's a special kind of action is what they say. Right? If you're going to get to know a person, what they do and what they say are important things in terms of getting to know them, right? Do you know people by what they do and what they say? Is there anything else you can get to know about a person? What if you've never met that person? If you've never met the person, how can you get to know them? Ask them their name. Ask them their name. What if you ask me their name? Like, I, you didn't know them, but I did know them, and you asked me their name, and I could tell you their name, right? That's another way? Yeah. Yeah, and if you did that, then that would be the third thing, which is what other people say about them, right? So that's the basic ways that we can know God. Know God by what he does, by what God says, and what other people say about them, right? Now, if that was you, Clara, if that was you, can we know everything about Clara by just what you do and what you say and what other people say about you? Or is there more to it? Right? There's more to it. There's a record, but there's always more. There's stuff inside of you that you've never acted upon, that you've never said, that you've never spoken, but yet it's there, right? So there's a constant need. If you want to know somebody, you have to get into what we call a relationship with them and learn from them by what they continue to do and what they continue to say and what people continue to say about them, right? The same is true with, with God, is that we each, to know God more fully, we want to have that relationship. And so during the time of Lent, the adults and the children are going to be studying this very question of what is, who is God, and thinking about what he does, what he says, and what people say about him. All right, so let's pray and thank God and ask God to bless us in our quest. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We seek to know you better. We seek to know your ways. We seek to know you, your very being. And so bless us on our quest as we seek, as we ask, as we knock on the door. We ask that it could be open and that answers will follow. And we know that this journey is never complete. Um, and that we're never done, that we never can grasp fully, but we always ask that we might come to know you more and that we could grow nearer and nearer and nearer, both to you and to the people that we walk through this life with. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who shows a great example of you trying to also know us better by offering yourself as a relationship with us. 
In his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Um, did everybody see these that were by the um, door? If you didn't get one um, and, and would like one, it'd be good, even if you don't take it home with you, it'd be good to have during the service. Um, does anybody need one of these? That's out, because I can get Corley to grab them. Or looks like Joyce has got them, so we're good. Anybody? You can share with someone in your household if you need <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we seek you. We seek you and with our very being. We want to know you more fully. Um, open our hearts and our minds and our lives to that wonderful quest of seeking, of the quest of a lifetime, the journey of a lifetime, coming to know you better and coming to know those that we walk through life with better. Help us hear your word, see your actions, and, and listen to what folks throughout time have said that we can have your Holy Spirit lead us into the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as I was telling the children, um, during Lent we're going to be studying, and I hope that you will take um, advantage of, of this. There are different levels that you could immerse yourself. You could um, immerse yourself just a little bit by asking the question, who is God in your life? Um, you can, I will be giving out these devotional things um, for each week. Um, each week will have a day and a theme and you can see that outlined in what you have. You can um, read through that, that would be another level. You can read through that and engage with the questions. Um, you can do a number of things and I invite you to figure out what it is best uh, for you to do. Um, this morning, I want to introduce the topic and I want to seek to give the reason that seeking the answer to this question is important. Um, and note I said seeking, right? Because not necessarily finding. Um, there is a difference between seeking and finding. Seeking is, of course, the act of looking, whereas finding is the end. The final piece, the goal. In seeking to know God, there really is no end piece. Um, you cannot know an infinite, eternal being fully. There's always more. There's always more to us, as I was pointing out with Claire as the example. There's always more to us that we haven't shown. And so imagine that with something infinite and eternal like God is. Instead, what you do is you orient yourself toward you lean, you immerse yourself in, you engage, and doing all those is seeking the divine. You never grasp. Actually, as we'll see, it's usually the grasping that people get into trouble. It gets people into trouble when they grasp. They have a piece, and they're quite sure that their piece is the whole. And the thing about a piece is when you have a piece, it can be wielded. It can be used. It can be controlled. And God can't be any of those things. If you look through history, you'll see millions of times where God has been used, he's been wielded, and he's been controlled, and all of them end in catastrophe. And I do not want to give 
some pseudo postmodern suggestion that God is relative to our thoughts, that God is somehow a relative be being, that you have your God and I have mine and he has hers and whatever else. I don't want to give the idea that we create God by thinking God into existence. Instead, I want us to think about a God who actually is. Whether we think him or not, whether we know him or not, whether we believe in him or not, doesn't make a difference as to whether God exists or does not exist. Now that seems to be such a simple concept, but it's a challenging one for our times. Where we have my truth and your truth and his truth and our truth. What we seek is the truth. And we might never grab it, but remember our point is not to wield it, to beat other people over the head with it. It's simply to get to know it better. Whether we know God or not does not limit in any way the being that God is. God is despite us, and our knowledge of him does not make him. And the limitations our knowledge puts on God does not limit So there is this primal, perfect, proactive, provocative, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent being that we seek to worship and to know because he created the world and everything is sovereign over all that is. Perhaps... Even those are unfair starting points. I just made a number of assumptions. They're unfair to start with all of those assumptions in place for a study like this. In a perfect, I don't say in a perfect world, but in a perfect study, we would begin without any preconceived notions about who God is. We would begin with a, a blank slate a empty coloring book, and we would allow the investigation itself to fill in the spots where we were coloring. We'll do the best we can. It's hard to start empty. And I'm not sure, honestly, whether actually starting empty would be right or not. One thing I promise you, though, is that I will not be providing you with any answers. I do not wish to do that anyway. When I do it on accident, realize that that is my weakness coming forward. I do not wish to give you any answers. Instead, I'm going to offer questions. Give you some clues and possibly a method of seeking, and then my intention and my goal is hopefully then to set you free to fly and find the answers yourself. Because I, first and foremost, most, am a seeker like you are. I do not wish to, to just give you my knowledge, but instead to have you seek for God yourself. I do this, again, not because I think God is relative, but because I have faith that in seeking, you will find something that is the source of everything that I know. I'd rather you find the source than for me to fill in details that are not connected to the source. Not details that I know, not any clues I have been given but instead to provide you with seeking of the source. And from that source, my hope is that we can then learn from each other. Such is where truly the, the goal of this study lies, but it's really the, the, the goal of all that we do in any kind of Christian education. We seek to grow closer to God and we seek to go, grow closer to each other. 
If you've been in any of my Sunday school lessons or Bible study type things, that is typically at the prayer that we say. May we, through this, grow closer to you and closer to each other. Closer, always closer. That being the case, I want to show you something that sparked this idea in my head. It was already floating around a little bit, and this kind of cemented that this is what I wanted to do this Lent. I came across this book. You see that it has not been read much. It was a gift from my uncle, autographed by the guy who wrote it, who was the um, clerk of their session for... 25, 30 years or something like that. And that is his claim to fame. He is not any, um, he did not go to seminary. He did not study at some university. He did not do any of that. He simply lived within the church as a leader within the church for that length of time. He writes this article, which was on January 13th. It says, Barriers to Spiritual Renewal. He says, I do not know all of the barriers to spiritual renewal by any means. Two of them, however, I believe I know without a doubt. The first barrier to, barrier to spiritual renewal breaking out in any church is that we do not really know who God is. I read that and I was like, whoa. It's an interesting, provocative statement. And he puts an exclamation point at the end of it. Instead, in our American culture, we practice a kind of pragmatic idolatry. Our faith's, faith is useful and functional as we apply it in our routine worlds, but, it, but does it ever run deeper? Right? That's why I said, when we know a piece, we can wield it, we can use it, we can control it. It is practical. We have to look at the meaning behind our actions, even inside the church. The culture around us has a nasty way of infiltrating the way we conduct ourselves. For example, we make the God of the church the size of its budget or attendance. When a group of preachers gets together for the first time, usually the first question they ask of each other is something like, how many do you have in Sunday school or worship? He says this is pragmatic idolatry. Success is measured by the number of bodies in the building. The numbers become all important and function as our God. The second barrier to spiritual renewal and another symptom of our church's decay is the need to be busy. As Americans, we tend to define our worth as persons by the degree to which we are busy. Our busyness justifies who we are and gives us our meaning. We have taken that kind of sentiment to the extreme. Being still and quiet has become, an, become anti-American. A good American is a loud American. A good American is an American who never stops working. I don't know if he did this on purpose, but there are two things in those, both of those spiritual um, barriers that he mentions that are the same in both of them, which is um, we seek to define or control or measure. We seek to measure. And one, we're measuring what God is, and the other, we're measuring our own worth by how busy we are. In both of them, we are seeking to measure. And I thought to myself, yes, I resonate with that, right? If we are to not judge by the number of people in our Sunday school classes or in our church or our budget, what then are we to judge by? Is this just what small churches say to excuse the fact that they don't have numbers. But I thought to myself, yes, I resonate with what he's saying. Because all of these questions don't have to do with what God is, but how God might be used as a way to measure. I wonder if one of the sources of our national issues or any church issues that we may have, even my own personal issues that I have, that they may stem because I have stopped seeking to know God fully. We as a church have stopped seeking to know God fully. We as a nation have stopped seeking to know God fully. Um, that maybe I have him all wrapped up and maybe I have it either wrong 
or at least have somehow limited what God might be. I've taken for whole something that is very much only a part. Why? Because it was easy to do so or it was functional to do so. If that's the case, I want to re-engage with these questions. I know that it's needed because I turn on the TV or the radio or listen to anything in the public square and I find a very different understanding of God from the one that I have. I hear all kinds of things that just don't really jive with what I, I... I know that we're using the same word, God, but I wonder if maybe we're not speaking the same language when we do it. I hear people talk and they say things about God, but then they say other things too and that they don't really coincide. And the fact that they don't coincide, the gap is completely lost on the person saying both of the things. I hear people quoting the Bible and making assumption about, assumptions about what is there, and I'm like, I don't remember that being there. And either I, it isn't there, and they, they're speaking wrong, or it is there, and I'm clueless. And both of those are possible and probable, and often the case. I see people folk, uh, posting on Facebook these promises of God. Click this, and here's the promises of God. Posting biblical support verses that are in support of whatever the claim was. And then you go and check out the verses based on this. Nobody ever does that, but I did once. You go and check them out, and they're like, it doesn't say that. And I wonder, do we really know God at all? And we know the word, but has the word itself become the commandment against using it in vain? And I think about the Israelites in the Old Testament and how many times they continually fall away from God. And, and, I, and I see them, and I, and I wonder, do they even realize the point in which they fell? Um, the following Old Testament lesson is representative of what's called the, the, ju the judges cycle, right? They're with God, they turn away, they fall deeper into sin, God saves them, they return to God, and such and such, it happens over again. This is description of the bottom of that place. Judges 10, 11 through 14. The Lord replied, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, and the Amalekites, and the Mayanites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their, from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go out and cry to the gods you have chosen and let them save you next time you're in trouble. Somehow, along the way, they traded God for gods, and we call this idolatry, right? We wonder how they could do such things. How just a few generations apart from seeing the Red Sea part, a few generations later could stray so far away and forget and substitute. You wonder exactly where it was that the slip sliding away began. Was it all of a sudden or was it gradual? Something gets a little bit off. It gets introduced. At first, it's questioned like, no, we shouldn't do that. But it's persistent and it stays. Pretty soon it becomes, yeah, that's God. We've always worshipped him in this way. And pretty soon, something completely different is going on. And if you were to question it, the we've always worshipped him this way, would become the refrain. What do you mean? We've always worshiped God this way. Is that true? Who knows? 
We see it often in Judges. We also see it in Kings. Someone builds an altar to God out on a hillside. And pretty soon, that altar to God becomes an Asherah pole, and God has become Baal. And if you were to study Baal and Astarte, who they were, they might just be a short, wrong turn away from God. But they are that wrong turn, and pretty soon, a simple, small turn has replaced God fully. In their day, it was a small stone statue. In our times, it might be something much more small, much more seemingly insignificant, but in time, it grows to a big, huge problem. And as Elder Lowry said, the cost is a barrier to spiritual renewal. Stagnation is found where life-giving waters once flowed. Remember, almost a year ago now, it was my first sermon before the pandemic really got in swing. Jesus and the woman were at the well. Jesus offers her, offers her the willing, the living water. And she says, but I have no bucket and you have no bucket. How are we to hold this living water? Jesus offers spiritual renewal and the woman offers back a barrier. Something practical, like a bucket. What barriers do we have in place? Do they stem from us not seeking God fully? These are the questions that we are going to ask. This is what the basis of this is. And maybe we'll find that we don't have any in place, and that would be a wonderful thing. Um, maybe. Maybe. Look at the New Testament lesson here from Paul in Romans. He is outlining the exact problem, the problem from which all of our troubles flow, right? If we talk about and sing about in the, in the doxology, we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. This is the opposite. This is the problem from which all troubles flow. This is the basis for the need for Christ, according to Paul. This is the need for salvation. This is the difficulties in the world. This is all of it. The one thing that he describes, this is uh, Romans chapter 1, 18 to 25, I think. Um, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now we hear that, we hear wrath, we hear wickedness, and the first thing that we do, we might think, hmm, that doesn't apply to us because there are a lot of bad people in the world and they're a lot worse than we are, and so that's cool. Beware of doing such things. All shapes and sizes. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, <coughs> his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been <coughs> being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. In other words, everybody's got a little seed planted about who God is in their mind. But although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies and with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Now, just like that first paragraph, it was easy to just cast off that stuff as the, the wrath of God is for the wicked. It would be easy to cast off verse 24 and say, oh, that's for the sexually impure. We can point fingers away instead of allowing them to look at ourselves. The idea, though, is here is that it says they exchange the truth about God for a lie. In other words, they didn't know who God was. Willfully. 
In my statement of faith, I wrote this, the ignoring God is the root of all sin. That it might be ignorance, or it might be, kind of know that, but I don't really like that. So I'm going to move in this other direction. The unknowable is replaced by the knowable, right? The unseeable is replaced by a statue you can see. Auden, W.H. Auden, the poet, said in a, his Christmas poem, the Christmas Oratorio, he said, the greatest fear that human beings have is the void, the emptiness. The idea that you thought that God might be behind you, but if you actually were to turn around and look, your fear that he wouldn't be would be enough to have you never turn around. The void, the absence of God is the greatest fear. So instead of actually turning around, we never do. Because we're afraid that he might not be there. Like the kid that is afraid that he can't catch the touchdown pass, so he never goes out for the team. The kid that is afraid that he will fail his math test, so he never really gives his full effort. The exchange is made the truth for the lie. I'm not good enough. Is one of those lies. And what Paul writes, you can see in the next few verses when he goes and starts to list all of the evils of the world. Um, that the results of this are truly devastating. And, but it's clear that, that Paul seems to be talking about the Gentile world here. So he flips and starts to talk instead about the Jewish world and those who were supposed to know God. And he comes to the conclusion that they also have the same similar problems. That the God that they thought they were supposed to know, the God who gave them laws, instead of following the laws, they decided to pick and choose which ones they would follow to apply them inconsistently to other people. And so they made themselves a version of God by doing this. Calvin writes that our knowledge of God is inseparable from our knowledge of ourselves. It's like the first half of this huge book. It's based on that prop property alone. In ourselves, we look at ourselves and we can see the wonders of God's creative hand. We're amazed by the human body and all that it can do. We're amazed by the world that we live in and how it provides for us. We can see God in that. But we should also see the undeniable truth that we are very much not God. And so it's this flip side, knowing yourself, knowing God, allows you to grow into what the knowledge of each is, right? We see the chasm. If you get to know yourself and get to know God, you get to see the great chasm that exists between us about who God is and what God can do as opposed to us. Without this knowledge, we see no chasm. We see no chasm. Only humans and our abilities is all that's left. We take God out of the equation. And the sad sad results of human trying to fix all these problems ourselves. But enough about this. I think we can see enough of the reason to do this exercise. To put out the welcome mat of our minds, to bring information in, and then make decisions about what we think the truth is. We need not dwell on how we have been wrong or how we are right, but simply that there is more out there for us to find. That in seeking God, we cannot be wrong. Because among the many things that Jesus tells us is he says, seek and ye shall find. And the interesting thing about the Greek word for seek is that it means seek and continuing to seek. And then it means find and continue to find. Both of them are in that imperfect tense. 
where it means now and ongoing. Never completed. Seek, seek, seek. Find, find, find. That's the cycle that we should be in as opposed to the cycle that the Israelites found themselves to be in. Christ invites us into this by his very being, right? It's, it's, it's as if God is sending out Christ as the, the most amazing olive branch in history. I seek to know you. Seek to know me. Do so through my son with whom I am well pleased. Grow in this knowledge. I think you'll find that it's helpful on a spiritual level. And I've always found it to be tremendously interesting. It's tremendously interesting to learn about God. There's so much there. I don't know how many discussions I had with high school students, apathetic high school students when I was teaching. Apathetic, seemingly apathetic in all that they did. You start talking about God and they get interested. Especially if you're not telling them what to think. If you tell them what to think, lights out. If you invite them to explore with you, it's amazing how exciting they can be and how excited they can be. So, so I hope to do this together. I want to, um, if you look at the thing that I handed out really quickly, you'll see kind of the outline there on the back of the first page and the, and the second page. Um, this is a general flow of what it's going to look like. Week one is just this short half week starting Thursday. A method introduction, why characterization, all right? That characterization says the way that we can know about something is to, by what it does, what it says, and what people say about them. So that's how the next three weeks will be. What does God do in the Bible? What does God say in the Bible? And then... The fourth, week fourth, is what do we say? And that would include um, hymns, poems, articles, speeches, sermons, whatever, and those of other faith traditions. What are they saying about God? And how similar or different are the gods that are being described? It'd be interesting to find where those lines are. So, then week five, six, and seven deal with the um, kind of um, problems of not knowing God. That's the week five idolatry. That's going to be looking at what the things are that are typical ways that we might idolatrize God. And most of them have to do with putting God in a box and making him smaller than he probably is. Um, week six is about relationship. God having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then week seven is about the promises that God has in that relationship. And you will see that each of them are the promises of the Lord's Prayer. Kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven, daily bread, forgiveness, deliverance, and forever. And forever is Easter Sunday. So I hope that you will go on this journey with me. You'll look at, you'll see that there are each day um, for the first week and a half, there are devotional things there. In those devotional things, there's something for you to read. There are Bible passages to look at as well. And then there are, it says, time to think. These are questions and they're all there, there to think. If you want to write down thoughts like a journal, do it. If you want to um, read over the questions and not think of them again, do them. But they're, they're there as prompts. They're there to get you thinking about possible thoughts that you might have. So it's all kind of in, inviting you um, without necessarily steering you in any direction. Um, along the way, I will put on um, online uh, different things, uh, videos of me going through some things or talking about things. Um, oh, e each day there's also a song to listen to um, on, on the computer if you, if you have that connection. Um, so, so, so look for those other things as we go, but I, but I hope that you will, number one, enjoy it, and I think your enjoyment will be connected to how engaged you are in it, and, um, but that's up to you, all right? Um, let's...
close then in prayer and our prayers for the people. Almighty God, thank you so much for this world that you've created. Thank you for the many acts that we can see throughout the Bible, culminating, of course, with your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that you have said through covenants, through promises, through the law, through your, pro through your prophets, through Christ himself. We thank you for the countless number of, of people throughout the ages who have written and described you, who have written about their own experiences of you, who have tried to um, paint a picture uh, that we might see. Help us to, to bring all of these ideas into ourselves, decide what we think is right, what we think is not right, but in all the times trying to grow closer to you. And maybe through the sharing of these ideas, we might grow closer to each other as well. May we realize that we are all equals, that no one is a, a front or behind, but that we are all seekers and we are seeking out the truth. Be with us, bless us as we engage in this study and in this Lenten season. May it be something that Lent is about, which is preparing us for Easter, preparing us to understand the life-giving sacrifice and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. That which makes life and life abundant and life eternal possible. We hope that this message, this, this study will spread to people, that we can share it, that we can go on this journey together with many in hopes that we might find more and more opportunity. We pray with those that we have mentioned who are battling sicknesses, whether heart disease or cancer or COVID or whatever else. We pray with those who are also Suffering loss, loss of loved ones, loss of friends, loss of children, loss of possessions, loss of abilities. May they find, if not replacement, a path and a way forward connected in you to a place and to a relationship that will never leave us alone and wanting. We ask this in all things, in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy work be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Connected to the weekend welcome, I sent a digital copy of the handout. Um, so so you, you, you can have it that way in a, in a way to save paper at church. I don't want to necessarily always print out uh, the, the great number that I did. You know, I, I think I did 15 copies today. I'd like to make that uh, number smaller. So if you would like me to print out a copy for you, um, let me know and I'll make a list of how many to do. Otherwise, I won't make them, make them, make them for each week. Okay. Um, and all of it will be available through the email and then also on the website, Facebook, that kind of thing. All right. Um, our... Next hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, which is on the back of the bulletin. 